samples through all Markov chains. Right? So when you, are, when you all, uh, have a bunch of Fourier samples, you can approximate whatever you want through the average summation. Right? You never need to do the explicit uh, integration. Right? So so that means that we're going to use, uh, we're going to construct a Markov chain. Uh, which 
samples a sequence of uh, when the variables e1, d2 to the end. We hope that in the limit, the uh, distribution of those samples, meaning that those states at different stages, we're going to converge to uh, the uh, target posterior distribution. So target posterior distribution associates with some uh, probability model. For example, if you use this logistic regression, that will be the posterior distribution of your official weights. Right? If you use this in direct allocation, that will be topic words you know, and topic mixture, or whatever, right? So, <coughs> and usually we assume like the associated probability model, we can evaluate the draw distribution, right? And uh, then we hope that we can construct such a chain, MC, right? which, which is which is counterpart of this uh, probability model such that the limit of these samples of this chain will converge, its distribution will convert to the true posterior distribution. Right? So, and then to study the convergence property of a Markov chain, right, we introduced a concept called uh, environment distribution or stationary distribution. So what is environment distribution? So, so let us first uh, like give you a Markov chain, right? So what, what kind of things determine a Markov chain or determine a behavior of a Markov chain? Yeah, I heard one transition probability, right? Or transition kernel. What else? Yeah, the initial probability, right? So how do you choose uh, the probability of your initial spin? And how do you determine the transition kernel? Right? So transition kernel is denoted by this one, but it's just uh, a conditional distribution, right? Conditional probability of your next sample given the current sample. So we really denote <coughs> it by like this transition kernel. So given the initial uh, distribution of your first sample, the, the, the distribution of your uh, first sample and also the transition kernel, you can uh, determine the whole behaviors of Markov chain, right? So suppose a Markov chain has will finally converge to some distribution, then this distribution is called invariant distribution. Why is called invariant distribution? Or why is called invariant distribution or station distribution? So what's the concept? What's the definition of convergence distribution? Suppose a distribution P of star is an invariant distribution of, a, of some particular Markov chain, right? Which is characterized by this uh, uh, transition kernel. So P star is the invariant to this transition kernel means that if I use P star to sample a state to the end, right? And then use this transition kernel to generate the next sample of ZN plus 1, sample in the next stage. Then the joint, of the, then the marginal probability or marginal distribution of this next sample will, will follow the same distribution of P star. Now we say P star is invariant to this uh, uh, transition kernel, or in other words, this Markov chain. And why? Because if I use P star to generate my sample, then I use Markov chain to get the next sample. The next sample, the distribution is invariant. The distribution of the next sample is invariant. It's still the uh, previous distribution P star. So if you can imagine, like, in the, in the sequence of the samples Z1, Z2 to Zn generated by Markov chain, right, there are marginal distribution. Then the next sample, Zn plus 1, this marginal distribution will be changed, will always stay. That's why it's called stationary distribution, because it's never, it's never, it's never there, it never evolves. So, rigorously definition through a mathematical, uh, I mean, a rigorous mathematical definition will be like this, right? So, if I want to calculate the marginal distribution of Zn plus 1, I'm going to first uh, use this P star to sample Zn and then multiply the transition probability. So, this is actually the joint probability of Zn and the Zn plus 1. Right? And now you marginalize out Zn. 
you get the marginal probability of your next uh, sample or marginal distribution of that sample. So if this marginal distribution is the same as P star, namely the distribution of the end, then we say P star is invariant to uh, the transition curve of T. This definition of invariant distribution. Right? So, um, of course, if you want to design my Markov chain without an algorithm, I need to ensure that my transition kernel has the property such that target posterior is invariant to this transition kernel. Right? That means if it converges, it will converge to my uh, true posterior. Right? And then there comes a question that how can we, for example, I can randomly take out a bunch of transition kernels. Right? How can I show that my target posterior will be invariant to, uh, to, to this uh, specific uh, design of the transition kernel? Right? So if you if you want to verify it through the definition, you have to do this uh, integration. Right? So we know that integration theory is not very friendly in practice, right? It's really intractable. So then we introduce uh, an important sufficient condition to justify the uh, universe. So this is called a digital max. So what is digital max? It just said, okay, I do not need to do this marginalization integration step, right? So if I want to, if I can verify that, uh, if I use this P star to sample Zn, and then through Zn jump to Zn plus 1, this jump probability is exactly the same as I use P star to sample Zn plus 1 first. And through the, the start from Zn plus 1, I jump back to Zn. If these two jump probabilities are the same, we say this P star and uh, this uh, transition kernel satisfy the digital balance, then we can conclude that the P star is invariant to this transition kernel. Okay. So to memorize that, it just means like you jump, the probability you jump out is the same as the probability you jump back. That's called digital balance. And they should be aware that digital balance is just a uh, sufficient condition. So meaning that if a uh, distribution and a uh, transition kernel satisfy the detailed balance, you say, okay, the distribution must be invariant to the transition kernel, but not vice versa. There can be some distribution who is invariant to T to the transition kernel, but they do not satisfy the uh, detailed balance. And this is the first uh, key step when we design a uh, Markov chain multi color algorithm. We have to uh, uh, Ensure that your design Markov chain um, your target posterior is invariant to your design Markov chain, right? The second thing is that in Markov chain, without any restrictions, it can convert to multiple distributions, right? It depends on what. So suppose I have a multiple invariant distribution. That is totally possible. And then who determines this Markov chain to converge to which distribution? I heard that, right? The initial distribution, right? As we just mentioned, two atoms determine the Markov chain's behaviors. First, the initial distribution. Second, the transition kernel, right? So if a Markov chain can, can have a has like multiple invariant distributions, then which distribution finally converges to is totally determined by its initial distribution. Right? So obviously, we don't want our algorithm to uh, our Markov chain to converge to a totally different distributions from our target distribution. Right? So we want like whatever starting distribution or whatever initial uh, setting my Markov chain will always converge to the same distribution or target posterior distribution, right? Then what kind of uh, Markov chains can satisfy this uh, requirement? Now 
that's released another important property of Markov chain breaking. It's called ergodicity. So come on, you should you should you should reveal the slides, right? So ergodicity just means okay, like suppose you're all possible sample space, right? Between every pair of the sample, you know, every pair of possible values in your sample space, there is kind of non-zero probability. You, your, your chain can, can start from here to jump here. Then this kind of chain is called ergodicity. So basically, and uh, informally, you can consider that it can traverse the entire info space rather than be restricted in a, in a specific region. Right? But that's, that's important. You can imagine, right, this is your posterior distribution, right? So I want ergodicity to ensure that my sample can gather samples across the whole info space rather than be restricted, say, by this single wall, right? That's why we require ergodicity. And if a market chain um, is ergodic, and if it converge, it, if it converges, it must converge to a unique uh, distribution. That's why when we uh, design a market chain for our sampling algorithm, we always require uh, the chain is ergodic. And if your chain is homogeneous, so what is homogeneous market chain? Yeah, it's a, the transition kernel has nothing to do with the step n, right? It's, it's constant to step, uh, to step n. This is called homogeneous. Otherwise, it's called uh, uh, inhomogeneous, right? If it's a homogeneous, then the requirement for a Markov chain to be ergodic is, uh, is quite weak. It's not that strong. And under, in many cases, under very mild uh, conditions, uh, your chain is guaranteed to be ergodic. So those are all about the uh, so the two uh, important prop, uh, properties uh, regarding Markov chains, environment distribution, and ergodicity uh, uh, guide us to design or develop your Markov chain uh, multiple sampling algorithm. Right? First, I, I'm going to construct a chain such that the target posterior is invariant to your transition kernel. Right? The, uh, the, the design of Markov chain multiple sampling is an art of design. Transition curve. Right? And second, I'm going to make this uh, chain to be uh, very friendly such that it's ergodic. So, no matter where you start with, you, you, you always convert to the same distribution that is our target posterior distribution. Right? And of course, Markov chains has a lot of other problems. There's a big book about Markov chains, and, but we only care about two problems. And uh, by the way, if your Markov chain is homogeneous and and uh, the ergodic, and ergodic, then the distribution, the unique distribution, converges to is called equilibrium distribution. So basically, equilibrium is just stationary; it's just a uh, invariant distribution. But it's just a, a special name under a special type of chains. So that's uh, that's. All the basics about Markov chain multiple uh, uh, algorithms, and then we use this principle to design the first uh, commonly used and very popular Mark Markov chain multiple sampling algorithms called entropy system. Right? So, what is entropy system algorithm? What is entropy entropy system? So we're gonna have like two two steps to generate a metropic testing sample. Right? So that means like my transition kernel uh, or the procedure of transition uh, can be can be uh, uh, considered as two steps. First, I'm gonna use some proposal distribution to generate a candidate, and then I run the test whether I'm gonna accept this candidate or throw it out. This is called metropic testing. So in the first step, I use a, I will use a proposal distribution to Q uh, to generate the uh, proposal to, to generate the candidate samples if I given the current sample zero n. Right? So a commonly used proposal distribution is just Gaussian distribution, symmetric. 
give it the n, and uh, you can tune the variance of your, your, you know, your, your Gaussian proposal. Right? So this is uh, the n, so it's not symmetric. And that probably is just a random and general one point surrounding uh, the n, right? And next, I'm going to test whether uh, I will use this candidate z prime as my uh, next sample or not. Right? So how can I do the test? We we'll accept z prime with the probability. <coughs> this is a weird formula. It's minimum between one and a fraction. Right? So in a numerical term, this fraction is the probability you jump out. So this is very similar to p 2 bias, but but it's not it's not a scenario where we use digital bias. It's just a, a scenario where we accept this deep product. But basically the numerical will be the probability you jump at. So that means you use a probability model to evaluate the probability of the candidate sum of Z prime with your observed data peak. And then multiply with the probability of using Z prime to generate a candidate sample, which is the end. So this, this is also like a jump back, right? So you start with your joint probability of the ball, and then generate ZN, and then use ZN to generate Z prime. But the way you generate Z prime is through some uh, proposal distribution. It's not some transition curve. And uh, and then I will, I will observe whether I will, I, will, I will look into if I use my probabilistic uh, model, the drawn probability to generate z prime first, and use the proposal distribution to generate z n back. Okay. I want to say the fraction of these two probabilities. So the numerator is the probability of uh, jumping back, and the denominator is the probability, uh, the original probability you uh, have. Generate the, the candidate sample of z prime. Right? So then I calculate this fraction. Obviously, if the probability of jump back, uh, if this fraction is bigger than one, is it it will it will be one, right? So you 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 you, you will you will definitely accept this uh, as an example, right? But if it's less than one, then you take the minimum. And how do you implement this? How do you implement I accept the z prime with this probability? What? Yeah. We just we first generate a uniform distribution random variable, right? And just test whether this uniform random variable is bigger, is less than this probability. If it's less than this probability, then we accept z prime. Otherwise, we reject it. We can calculate the probability that you accept it is this exactly this probability. Right? So just these two steps. You can choose arbitrary proposal distribution, and typical choice is a is a Gaussian. And then you test. You randomly test whether you accept this. If you accept it, z prime, then you set your next sample to be z prime. That means you accept it, right? Otherwise, you reject it. You set your next uh, sample to be a recurrent sample. So you can imagine that because you have a lot of rejection decisions during sampling procedure, actually your sample your samples, the sample set will consist of a lot of uh, uh, duplicated samples. Right? That's, that's kind of a uh, <coughs> um, property of your uh, of the samples generated from your entropic histing algorithm. Right? So they are, we have shown that by combining these two steps to construct a true transition curve, right? We have shown that uh, your target posterior will be a uh, will will satisfy the D2 bias with your with this transition curve. 
That means that the target posterior will be uh, invariant to uh, this uh, true posterior. And then we mentioned a special case. If your proposal distribution is symmetric, like Gaussian term. So if you switch Z prime and Z in here, you switch their position, your density value won't change. So that means when you calculate the accept probability in the numerical denominator, you have like a common factor, right? You can just cancel. So then to determine the accept probability, you only need to calculate a fraction of the drawn probability over the new sample divided uh, by the drawn probability uh, on the old sample. Then this algorithm is called entropy sample. So entropy algorithm is a special instance of entropy testing in that I'm going to use uh, only use a symmetric proposal distribution. Okay. And uh, entropy testing can give you a better insight. What kind of insight? So if you observe that, if you look at this fraction, uh, if your general sample, the candidate sample, increase the model likelihood, what will happen? This fraction will always be uh, bigger than one, right? That means you 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 will have a probability one to accept this new sample. But if uh, the uh, drawn probability of new samples decreases the likelihood, see the fraction becomes zero point eight, like you still have like quite a large chance to accept that sample, right? But it's not as that large chance to accept a sample that increases the likelihood. So you can imagine like if I have this uh, posterior distribution, right? So this is my current position. So you can, like, if I generate a sample at this position, right, in front of this position, I use my symmetric Gaussian. And then I must I will definitely accept this uh, new sample because it increases uh, the uh, John probability. But if you generate a sample along this way, then you have some chance to be rejected. Is it reasonable? No. Is it reasonable or intuitive? So first, this this algorithm is correct because the posterior will converge. Uh, the the chain will converge to the posterior, right? definitely. In theory, it won't trap. In practice, it will trap. Okay. So this this difference between this other difference here. So I don't want to be be be, be confused here. All right. So in theory, because your uh, transition kernel will traverse the entire sample space, so you finally traverse all the nodes. But in practice, uh, if you enter into some local mode. The time you jump out this local mode is kind of exponential to the number of steps or whatever. That means in practice, it won't you won't have sufficient time to wait until your samples to jump out. There's a difference between theories and, uh, and the practice. But in theory, there won't be a problem as long as your chain is uh, is over there. Does it make sense? Any question? Now here, I emphasize that why we, we, we can analyze this. Uh, what, what's the rationale of this uh, interesting property, right? So imagine um, we, we're going to generate a bunch of discrete samples, right? So essentially, we, we, we want the histogram of those uh, samples to be uh, more and more consistent with the uh, with the, the true posterior distribution, right? So that being said, in the high density regions, I must have a dense samples, right? And in low density regions, the samples must be quite sparse, right? Quite rare. Then I, when, I com when I compute histogram or empirical distribution, you'll see it will be uh, consistent with uh, 
the uh, true density, right? True posterior density. So now you can see the rational here, right? So if I if my general U sample, the candy sample, increases the likelihood, I have a lot larger chance to, uh, to accept it. Actually, I, I will definitely accept that, that sample. Right? And if my new sample decreases uh, the likelihood, uh, I have some chance to throw it, throw it up, right? So average, you will say, okay, finally, my samples, my sample will generate bunch of dense samples to be accepted the highest region. And uh, quite sparse samples because of rejection in the low dense regions. So that's why it will be consistent with your posterior density. So I want to see, I want you guys to, to see the connection between the behaviors of the sample and our the final results. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay, so um, Mitropolis histing heroism has uh, a lot of advantages. First, it's very, very easy to implement. As long as you can evaluate your drawn probability, you can just use you just use whatever symmetric Gaussian to generate candy samples and then do the uh, acceptance of ta acceptance task, and you can accumulate accumulate a bunch of samples until the burning step and you retrieve the samples, right? But there's no free lunch. It's easy, but it is a uh, very inefficient or sometimes ineffective. And uh, what's the what's the what's the key bottleneck? So. The key bottleneck of the uh, vanilla neutropic testing is the so called run and walk behavior. So, what is run and walk behavior? So, following uh, what we just uh, discussed, so we need to collect samples that fit the target of the student. In other words, the histogram of those samples uh, should be uh, more and more consistent with the posterior type. Right? In other words, we require many samples now. Of higher density regions and the much less samples on the low density regions. That's what we have to explain why you accept the samples which increases the likelihood definitely and have some chance to reject the samples which decrease the likelihood. Right? That's rational here, but also that's what we expect the sample will do, right? We expect that <coughs> on the Bernier step, you're going to have a lot of dense samples in the high density regions. And quite sparse, quite rare samples in the low density regions, right? Only this will be consistent with the true posterior density. But if your proposal distribution is kind of symmetric, like a Gaussian, right? It's kind of symmetric, uh, like Bell. You know, in a in a in a one dimensional space, right? I mean, okay, you generate an extra sample, equal likelihood in whatever direction, homogeneous direction, you, can, you have like equal, equal likely chance to jump to this direction, you have equal likely chance to jump to this direction, or other, whatever direction. Right? This is very, this, choosing that, that such kind of proposal, so, uh, proposal distribution um, is mainly for the convenience, because it's so easy. But the uh, disadvantage is that, if you by chance get a sample which towards the high density regions, we will have a much larger chance to be accepted. Right? But in many cases, you're gonna generate samples up in the low density regions for the true posterior. You have a large chance to be rejected. So as long as your sample is rejected, your current your computation, your effort to generate to compute this sample is risky, right? And for posterior distribution, as long as your model is uh, uh, is very uh, very um, informative, you can imagine that your posterior distribution will concentrate on a few modes, a few high density regions. Uh, most of other regions areas are low density regions, and then you just blind. And when you when you, when you when your proposal distribution generates ten million samples, you just blindly spread over the entire space. You can imagine that most of your samples will, will be simply rejected, will be wasted. That's the key button there. Does it make sense? So just, just like we have a target, we have a, we can target in, a, in, in, in that dog, right? But, but I'm just a drop, or I'm blind, just a, uh, I'm, blindly, I'm blindly shooting whatever, right? 
I shoot like for 100 bullets, no chance to get a target, right? That's the major issue of this so-called random walk here. Because it's random walk. No directional, no informative, just a uh, uh, random retrial. You just waste a lot of computation. That's the issue of the uh, uh, vanilla uh, entropic hissing algorithm. So in practice, people will rarely directly use this kind of entropic hissing. Unless I ask you to do very, very simple projects, say one dimensional or one scalar distribution, you might use that. Right? But for high dimensional uh, posterior sample procedure, you never use such kind of vector. So people always try to utilize the information from your model itself, like joint probability, to guide your sampling generation procedure toward high density regions. So such that you can increase the acceptance rate. The higher the acceptance rate you have, uh, uh, the less the computation uh, cost will be wasted, right? <coughs> so the key goal to design MCMC algorithm is to reduce run and walk behavior. So now let us look at the second type of uh, uh, a second uh, popular mark of chain on color sampling. It's called deep sampling. Deep sampling is very common use. And uh, uh, you, can, you can actually view it as, it as a special type of entropic histing algorithm. So an entropic histing algorithm which has the exception rate to be always one. And the key idea of deep sampling is to use conditional posterior distribution to sample each single or subset of random variables in the model. So just to partition your all the little random variables if, into different groups or even partition them individually. And I'm gonna fix uh, every time just to sample one single variable or a subset of variable given all the other little variables fixed, use the conditional distribution. And then I fix this new uh, sample of this individual variable and all the other variables to sample the next variable. We do it alternatively. It's very similar to a mean field version update. But mean field version update will always leave some gap of the between the your, your approximation and the true posterior. And give sample doesn't have such an issue. It's it asymptotically converges to the true posterior right? So accept read is always one of give something. And uh, if your in your probability model, your conditional distribution is tractable and easy to draw sample some. People will always try to use deep sampling. So there's no free lunch. If your condition distribution is not trackable, you cannot compute the condition distribution. You never think about uh, you never think about deep sampling. So what is deep sampling? So <clears throat> suppose our uh, probability model, the latent random run variables is, is denoted by z, right? Has uh, like m components, z1 to zm. And my joint probability uh, is a joint distribution of z and uh, this observed data b, right? So uh, to apply deep sampling, you have to assume that um, each component z i, given the remaining components z not i, namely all the other components excluding z i, and the data and the data d is trackable. Is it has analytical form and easy to generate samples. That's the pre assumption about deep sampling. And then we just do this sampling um, as follows. So we're going to initialize our uh, sample Z as the first step Z1. So Z11 to Zm1 means the initial sample for the M components, right? And then I do many, many iterations. Until uh, burning step, until it converts to the true posterior. And in each iteration, I will alternatively sample, generate new sample of each component. How can I do that? Right? Suppose we start from the first component. So I'm going to generate the new sample for the first component to give it the input. 
given the current sample uh, uh, denoted by Zn. Right? So I'm going to generate the new sample of the first component, Z1 plus 1, from the conditional posterior. So this is a conditional posterior. The conditional posterior of Z1, given all the remaining components, Z2 and Z3 and to Zn and beta. And due to this, I've got to update my first component. The new sample Z1 plus 1, right? So now, I'm going to replace the first component by this new sample, Z1 plus 1. And then sample the new sample, generate a new sample of the second component, Z2, from the conditional posterior. The conditional posterior is conditional to square of Z2, even Z1 plus 1. This new sample of, of the first component. And Z3, Z4, Zn. Remember, uh, be aware that these three to Zn are the old components right? because they haven't been updated. Right? So now I got I got my uh, new sample for the second component, Z2 of the plus one. Right? So next, I'm going to generate a new sample for the third component. Right? So I'm going to replace the first and second component by their new samples. So Z1 plus one, Z2 plus one. Then I use the condition distribution of D3, even all the remaining components, to generate a new sample of D3. So I got D3 plus 1, right? And I just continue to do that until you reach the last component. So the last component will be uh, updated through this condition distribution, ZM, right? ZM, given all the other components, right? Here, all the other components has already been updated by their new versions. That's it. After this uh, M steps, you get a new sample Zn plus 1, right? All the M components in this Zn plus 1 are updated. This gives them. It's very simple. Any question regarding the uh, algorithmic steps? Okay, so this is just a, 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 a and here we a, we sequentially generate the new samples for each component, so Z1, Z2, Z3, I mean, in the original order, right? But here we do not restrict the order. You can, you can choose actual order of your components. You can start from Zm, and then Zm minus 1 to Z1, or any order you, you like. It's just one. It doesn't. It does. It doesn't affect the results. So, in practice, um, we can also partition the random vector into subvectors and perform the similar uh, sampling procedure. Say, if you have like a long vector z, right? You can partition into like t vectors. So each z1, z2, to zt are subvectors, right? You can still do the same thing. Like each time you generate. The new sample, uh, this new vector of zi, right? given the other subvectors, and you you, you sequentially to do that until you generate all the um, new samples for all the new uh, for, 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 for all the subvectors, and this is called a block heap sum. Any questions so far? Okay, so I want to give you a concrete example. So, uh, I've ever widely used the uh, um, pattern is called matrix factorization. Okay, so, um, people use that uh, on Netflix, and Amazon, whatever places uh, to, um, to, to, to do the recommendation. So, I want to recommend uh, my. Uh, uh, I want to re recommend my uh, commodities. Um, like shampoos, uh, something to use. So I want to use a matrix factorization to find out a group of users uh, who, are, who share the same kind of interest, uh, a, group of, a group of products uh, who have the same kind of problems, right? So basically, uh, here we use the user movie rating data as an example. Right? So suppose I'm collecting the data, I'm, I'm the uh, manager of uh, IMDB, right? 
And so I have a, a huge amount of users. I have a, a huge database of movies, right? I have their readings, right? So uh, if, if this matrix, uh, each entry of this matrix actually work, actually indicates the rating of some particular user uh, rating on a, on a particular movie, right? And, but this matrix is really uh, sparse. And uh, a lot of entries uh, actually do not have the rating. So given this uh, movie rating matrix, uh, our task is that I want to estimate a feature vector representation for each user and feature vector representation for each movie from those rating, rating data. Why? Because uh, I'm going to use a vector to uh, describe the users, right? And then through the Euclidean space, we can look at the distribution of those vectors. Right? And those vectors, if they are close enough, we can assume that they share the same kind of interest in fun communities, then it's safe for me to, to, to recommend products, right? Like my friend purchased something, right? And if I if I my algorithm found out, okay, A and I are in the same group, I'm gonna uh, recommend the same product. And a similar argument apply to the movie, right? I want to use these vectors to discover the groups or even all liars in movies. And how can we uh, represent this uh, uh, estimation of the latent uh, of the feature vector procedure in terms of probability model? Yeah. So we assume this is a generative uh, model. There is the uh, probability sampling procedure to sample those uh, latent feature vectors for users and movies, and then given those latent feature vectors to sample the observed uh, regions. That's the idea. Right? So um, for each user i, we're going to introduce a k-dimensional latent feature vector, u of i, right? u i. And for each movie j, I will introduce a k-dimensional latent feature vector, dg. And then I will assign a, a, a simple assign a, a Gaussian distribution as a prior to generate those uh, latent feature vectors. And then, given those latent feature vectors, I will sample the rating Rij, namely the rating of user i on movie G from another Gaussian Lightning group, where the mean is the inner product between the latent factor representations of uh, user i and uh, the uh, latent feature representation of user i and latent feature representation of uh, movie G, right? Through some uh, uh, the variance is, uh, is tall. Right? That's it. It's a very simple model. And here, why we why 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 would we use the inner product here? So inner product uh, is kind of uh, some such kind of cosine distance, right? So it's just, you can you can consider as kind of a similarity measure between the two uh, feature representations, right? If they're similar, then I tend to give you higher rate. So we actually uh, encode the uh, uh, the theorem, user theorem in some movie uh, in terms of similarity measure. So now we can write down the joint probability. Uh -huh. I was curious, how do we get k if there's different number of users in the movie? How do you choose k? Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. There is no no answer about how to choose. It, it depends on. I like I cannot tell you which case is best. So in practice, people will like hyper. Yeah, choose hyperparameter, use cross validation, use many tuning, whatever uh, metric you, you want to use. It's a kind of trade-off. You, you cannot choose k to be very large, then the application of resources will be exhausted, right? But if k is too small, then uh, it might not be like fully be able to fully summarize the information in your in your, in your data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> now we can write down the joint probability of our matrix factorization model. Right? So the joint probability will over this uh, uh, feature vectors for all the users, feature vectors, all the movies, and, and also the the ratings. Right? So it will be composed as a product of the prior. All the users and for all the movies, 
and also the likelihood of each read frame. So here is uh, this O, uh, just represents the observed readings. Remember this matrix is sparse, right? The only uh, subset of entries has um, readings. Many, many entries do not have readings. Right? And then for each particular reading, uh, it is sampled from this uh, Gaussian likelihood. So the issue is that if you want to compute the posterior distribution of each uh, user's uh, feature vector representation or each movie's uh, feature representation, you will see it's intractable. You will not be able to compute. The key reason is that the likelihood, although it is Gaussian, Although it is Gaussian, but the mean of this Gaussian is the inner product between UI and BG. And UI and BG has both, uh, both have the Gaussian distributions. And for this uh, product of Gaussian for the variables, uh, there is no way to do the analytical normalization. That's something people have already discovered a long time ago. So you, are, you won't be able to calculate the normalization. So Looks like it's just a simple product of Gaussians. So then we have to seek for uh, approximate uh, inference patterns, right? <coughs> of course, you can use a uh, class approximation, you can use variational mean field, whatever, right? But if you skip something, you see it's very convenient. So how do we conduct keep something? How do we how do you just keep something to generate posterior samples for U and V? Keep some is to do uh, alternative samples, right? So I'm gonna fix uh, all the other lazy random variables and just uh, sample the update for for each particular lazy uh, random variable, right? So again, look at the here lazy random variables are, are latent, uh, latent, latent feature uh, feature vectors, right? So you can look at the latent feature vectors for each user, like u1, u2, to use the un, right? And you can look at the latent feature vector for each move is the U1, V2 to VM. So suppose you have M, maybe it's blue, right? So the problem gave something. I'm going to sample, I'm sequentially sample, sample U1 given all the other U's, right? And uh, given all the movies, right? Movies are uh, uh, latent, latent uh, feature vectors. And then you sample U2 given all the other users' written uh, feature vectors and movies' uh, feature vectors. Right? Just alternative to do that. And similarly, after you generate all the samples for users' feature vectors, you can sequentially sample the feature vectors uh, for each movie, right? So V1, even V0, and all the other users' feature vectors, and V2, even all the other feature vectors uh, of movies and users and blah, 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 right? So this follows the scheme of the uh, uh, sample plant. Uh, it doesn't affect the result, because this is, uh, this is stationary. Of course, you have, you have to ensure this is stationary. Uh, you have to ensure this is ergodic chain, right? If it's ergodic, it will always converge to that. True posterior. Does it make sense? This this procedure, right? It's just follow the standard recipe, recipe of the uh, of the uh, of this give sample, right? At first, the sample u one given uh, given all other u two u three u four to u n and all these feature vectors of v are fixed, right? And then I sample u two and fix all the other uh, uh, movie and user stuff uh, feature vectors. Right? Just continue to do that, right? So now let us just pick up uh, whatever. So suppose currently I'm, I'm going to sample UI. Right? Given the remaining users' uh, uh, feature vectors and all the movies' feature vectors, so 
what is the conditional posterior? So the conditional posterior will be like this. What is conditional posterior to sample UI? According to this drawing. This drawing. You can take a look, right? So we can just uh, look at which terms will contain UI, right? All the other terms which does not contain UI just throw it out the constant, right? So only so first in the prior terms, uh, only one prior term that is UI itself, right? That's for UI itself. So it will be proportional of prior UI itself, right? And in the likelihood, it will involve all the ratings, uh, it will include all the ratings that involve UI, right? Basically, it will include all the uh, movies that user I has written, right? So, we just uh, a product of I product of the movies such that the uh, uh, user I has written the movie and then the likelihood of the rating even the inner product, right? So this one is in Gaussian. So now we multiply to Gaussian, right? But but what's the what's the advantage here? I heard that, right? So VG here is considered as constant, right? Because it's condition, it's conditional distribution, right? So VG is con considered as constant. That means that uh, in the exponent of this uh, Gaussian distribution, it's just a quadratic form of UI itself, right? And in prior, prior to Gaussian, so no doubt the exponent will be a quadratic form of UI itself, right? So just some to a quadratic form of UI, it's still end up with a Gaussian. That means that your conditional posterior will be some Gaussian. Okay. Some Gaussian UI, given some mean and the coherence. Then just use that Gaussian to generate new sample of UI. Okay. Does it make sense? If you have done uh, the mean field version in framework, you'll see this is pretty straightforward. So I won't I won't derive the details here. Any question? Any question regarding this example? Huh? So after one step of turn off, then you buy and not not replacing the coordinate you buy, but the upgrading the probability of the new one. No, you have to replace you have to replace the UI to the current sample. And then given the current UI, you're going to sample, say, UI plus 1. Right? So remember that our, our, our algorithm framework is like this, right? So um, look, like we first generate the, the new sample for the first component, right? And then I replace the first component by this new sample. And I use this new sample and all the, all the other components to generate New component of uh, Z2, right? Uh, new sample of Z2. Then you get new sample of Z2, Z2 plus one, right? Now you use uh, the new samples Z1 plus uh, Z1 plus one, Z2 plus one, and all the other samples to generate a uh, new sample for Z3. What, what is the yeah, here's here Z is a uh, vector of scalars. The samples. It's a running vector, right? Each component is a scalar. How do you get posterior from this, this final step? Well, how can I get what? Posterior of what? Posterior distribution. We are estimating the posterior distribution. Yeah, we are estimating posterior distributions from the samples, right? Suppose you have using this procedure, you, you have you're gonna collect a bunch of samples, right? You use those samples to create a uh, discrete empirical distribution, like histogram for approximate to posterior. Right? It's still in a Markov chain how something. 
Any other question? So this kind of blocks keep something, right? Every time you update a vector rather than a single scalar, right? You, you update this k-dimensional vector for u1, then you give it this u1 and all the other used to update uh, the second k-dimensional vector for u2, right? And you continue to do that until you generate samples for all the users. And then alternatively, you generate new samples for all the uh, Ruby so, uh, uh, feature vectors. Oh, oh, okay. So then you do it for the Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. The, 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 the initialization has nothing to do with the rate matrix R. You can, you can randomly initialize U and V. It only counts when you have a condition for steel, right? Because when you have a condition for steel, you have to involve the weight matrix R. Yeah, of course. That is not dependent on other. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. It's not strange at all. It's not strange at all. That's correspond to our probability bar models, right? So your full condition for steer, right? Your full condition for steer of u1 given u2 to un, right? v1 to vn, and also the whole v matrix R, right? This is your full condition for steer. But it turns out that. U1 is condition dependent to all the other random variables given its mark of blanket. So actually, your condition part is largely reduced. So in practice, you always use that such kind of properties to reduce the condition. That's connects to what we have discussed before. Any other question? Yeah, I'm glad to see you guys are trying to make connection between what we have discussed. Ah, okay. okay, so <coughs> next step is kind of theoretical step. We need to prove why keep sampling is correct. Like why this kind of simple. And with the update will uh, guarantee you to convert to the true procedure, right? So again, as we mentioned before, right, to show that your Markov chain is correct, you should you should you should you, you need to show two properties. First, your target procedure is invariant. To your chain, to your transition current, right? Second, your chain is always meaning that whatever initialization you have, you're gonna converge to the true procedure. So, first, how do we show the inverse? Right? So, here we directly use the definition to show the inverse. We do not use video balance, although we can also use video balance to show that. Right? It turns out that using definition is even, even simpler. So, so first we need to figure out what is transition current. So to fulfill a transition kernel, actually you have to conduct M steps. If your Z, like your latent random variable, has M components, right? Because I'm gonna first sample, I'm gonna first sample Z1 plus one, given Z2, Z3 to Zm, right? And then, then given Z1 plus one, Z3 to Zm, I'm gonna sample Z2 plus one. Right? I'll continue this step for m times to go through all the components to generate uh, the whole new vector z plus one. Right? So actually, my transition kernel is the product of this uh, m conditional probabilities, right? Or conditional posterior probabilities. So now, given this transition kernel, how can I show that 
Um, if the starting sample at the end follows the target posterior after this M step, your updated uh, sample Z M plus one will also respect this target posterior. We want to look at this one. We want, we want, we want to look at Y. So the key observation here is that to show the inverse, we assume first the Z respect target posterior, right? So that means Z two n the M, just the second to last component, they will follow the marginal true posterior, right? Meaning I marginalize this uh, I marginalize this uh, posterior distribution on Z1. So if you write down the joint uh, distribution of Z2 and to Zm, it will be a, a posterior distribution of Z2n to Zm given D. Right? That's a key observation. Now let us look at how can we generate Z1 and plus 1, right? How, how can we generate new sample for, Z, for the first component, namely Z1 and plus 1? We use uh, the conditional posterior. So conditional on Z2 to Zm and the data, we generate uh, Z1 and plus 1. So now I want to ask, what is the joint distribution of this Z1 plus 1 and Z2 n to Z n. How to compute this joint distribution? How can we how, how compute this joint distribution? Yes. But it's not very rigorous because it's just one step of condition. So you see, this is a conditional distribution, right? Z1 n plus 1 given Z2 to Z n, right? And then Z2 to Zm follow this, right? So now if you want to know what is the joint probability of Z1 plus 1, Z2, n, dot, 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 Zm, n, you just multiply this with this, right? And we multiply it with this. It's actually the posterior distribution of uh, Z1 plus 1, Z2, and your Z, oh sorry, Z2, then Z10, then even Z5. Does it make sense? Right? This is a two posterior with the first components marginalized off, right? And this is a conditional posterior. <coughs> Of the first component, given all the other components. So multiply together, you will cover the whole, the full posterior, right? Mm -hmm. So that means, okay, if you look at the joint distribution of your new component, Z1 plus 1, and old components, Z2 and to Zm, they join to follow the true posterior. Right? That's a key observation. So that means, okay, after I generate a new component, my Joint probability after replace the old component with new component won't change. It still respect target posterior, right? It's the first step. And second step applies the same argument, right? Exactly the same argument. Why? Right? Because, uh, because if you you if you, you 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 know that Z1 n plus one, Z2 M to uh, Z2 N to Z M then they follow the exact posterior, right? So that means if you marginalize out the second component, Z1 n plus 1, Z3 n to Zm, they will follow this marginal posterior, right? And then you multiply with this conditional posterior, you recover the joint distribution of Z1 n plus 1, Z2 plus Z1 n plus 1, Z2 n plus 1, and Z3 n to Zm, they're going to still follow true posterior, right? 
So now you see, after you generate every new component, your new components and old components will jointly follow the target steer. The distribution does not change. Uh -huh. In the case work, we still have to choose the right This is a transition curve. The transition curve asks for the product of this and conditional posterior probabilities. Right? This is our choice of transition curve. We, we, we are now showing that if you choose this transition curve, every time we generate a new component, you combine a new component with old components, it won't change the target posterior. Does that make sense? Right? So that means if you finish all this M step, M steps, your full new vector, so Z1 and plus one, Z2 and plus one to Z M and plus one will jump to follow the target posterior as well. That means okay, after I do this whole transition step, my marginal distribution of Z N uh, of the of the new sample won't change the target posterior. So target posterior is invariant to this transition curve. Does it make sense? So again, let me. Yeah. No, target posterior is true posterior. It's the same word. To show the to show the inverse, assume okay, my current step, my current sample is generated from this true posterior, right? And now I apply this transition kernel, I generate the next sample Z plus one. I want to show that the n plus one will also follow with this target posterior, this true posterior. That's the idea. The, the peak in the transition kernel is the transition kernel is Conditional posterior, but the but the joint posterior you will you you are not you are not able to know. That's the key difference, right? We assume that you can always evaluate your conditional posterior, but if you want to move this conditional part to here, you you can do nothing. You cannot move that to that. That's why we use this uh, conditional posterior to uh, approximate true posterior. So that's uh, a key idea. Does it make sense? So, <coughs> so the first part is proof, right? We show that it is uh, it always it is invariant to the target posterior. If your sample is generated from the true posterior, then through this skip sample step, the new sample will also follow the true posterior. So it's invariant. That's good. But next, we need to show that. Your chain is a uh, right? Otherwise, if you switch to another initialization, it might converge to a totally different distribution, not true posterior, right? And here, uh, you need to be careful. Um, we can claim that your Markov chain based on if something is ergodic if none of the conditional distribution will be zero anywhere in the sample space. Like our previous case, like the like matrix factorization, you know each conditional posterior is simply a Gaussian, right? So it won't be zero anywhere. So it must be over there. And usually if it is continued, if your if your conditional posterior is continued distribution, so you won't worry about them. But if, it, but, but if it is discrete or have weird shapes, you should worry about that. And you need to explicitly show the algorithm. So, 
Uh, intuitively, you can think of if you are if you have like conditional posterior, right? You have conditional posterior, but but the conditional posterior has zero density in some regions. Obviously, your conditional posterior won't sample your your component to traverse these regions, right? So you can imagine uh, it is likely that it's not urgent. Possibly there are some kind of uh, regions it cannot it, it cannot cannot travel right? or pass, right? So <clears throat> if something is a uh, quite uh, uh, quite straightforward, but there is an alternative view of this something. Uh, we can consider it as an instance of the tropical system. So an iteration of keep something is equivalent to m steps of uh, the tropical system update. And each update, each step, with acceptance for probability one. So uh, to show that, we can look at just one step with all loss of generality. We can first sample elements, and the other elements will see all exactly the same procedure. Right? So <clears throat> if you just look at one step of keep something, say, I'm going to sample the first component given all the other components, right? Then the proposal distribution will be the conditional probability. Z1n given Z2n to Zm, right? And this is a proposal distribution, right? Remember, we, we now switch back to our metropic hasting uh, procedure. We're going to first uh, generate a candidate sample from the proposal distribution and then test it whether I'm going to accept it or not, right? So my proposal distribution will be the conditional distribution of Z1 given Z2n to the end. And now, suppose I've done that, I got my new sample Z prime. We know that Z prime only has one distinct element, that is first component. All the other components are the same. Right? So I want to see whether I'm going to accept Z prime. Right? So if you look at the calculation of acceptance probability, so in a numerator of this fraction, we have the joint probability of the uh, new sample, this is Z prime. So only has uh, the first uh, component to be new sample, like Z1 is 1, the remaining samples, Z2, and the remaining components are the same, and then multiply with the proposal distribution, right? So it's P of Z1, because it assumes that you Z prime to generate Z1. So part U is Z1, and given Z2 and to Zm, given D, right? And the denominator will be the joint probability of the old sample. So it's P of Z1 and Z2 and to Zm. And the proposal is uh, the normal proposal. <laughs> I use the current Zn to generate Z prime. So it will be the conditional distribution of Z1 uh, given Z2 and to Zm and to generate this new sample Z1 plus 1. So just a, a straightforward application of this uh, problem. Then we we can observe that if we so look at look at the drawn probability here right? in the denominator and numerator I have drawn probability uh, on new sample and whole sample. Right? If I divide both strong probability by the marginal probability of Z, Z2 to Zm and D. And what will happen? So if you divide the first, if you divide the first part by Z2 and Zm and D, you actually move uh, the condition part here, right? And the second part, you move the condition part here. So now, surprisingly, we found that this term will coincide with this term. And this term will coincide with this term. So they'll cancel. That means uh, this acceptance probability is one. So you say, like, after the first step, I'm going to accept u1 plus 1, right? And after the second step, I'm going to uh, accept the new sample for the second component. And after all the m steps, I'm going to sample all the new components. So it's a metropolis. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special uh, metropic hissing 
uh, with each step of accepting weight to the world. Okay, I think, yeah, I think we should stop here. And uh, we'll, uh, in the next lecture, oh, in the next lecture, uh, our TM will give a, a tutorial on TensorFlow. And because uh, we're going to have uh, this topic. So, but uh, but uh, but you are required to implement that this neural network. That means we're gonna do some uh, uh, tutorial on that. Okay. <laughs>